Hello, and welcome to the American Library Association's Financial Learning Series. Anyone who is involved with the association for any length of time understands that ALA is a very diverse and complex organization. This is particularly true in the area of finance, where the interrelationship between all of its units, programs, and activities is very strong. Whether you're a longtime member of the association or you've just joined for the first time, understanding ALA's finances can be very challenging. In an effort to minimize this challenge, as well as to provide those with financial responsibility and specifically those interested in serving on ALA committees with a better understanding of ALA's fundamental financial concepts, the Budget Analysis and Review Committee, BARC, has prepared a number of finance-based webinars called the Financial Learning Series. These webinars are designed to cover a number of key and basic financial concepts that staff and member leaders deal with on a daily basis in carrying out their responsibilities. Additionally, they will be available for you to access at your convenience and the submission of questions through ALA Connect are strongly encouraged. The topic of discussion for this session is the organizational structure which will be presented by James Neal, ALA Treasurer and Vice President for Information Services and University Librarian at Columbia University. And with that, I'd like to turn the discussion over to Jim. Thanks, Keith. Um, as Keith indicated, today we're going to focus on the organizational structure, how the different parts of ALA influence the budget and finance planning and execution process. Fundamentally, we're dealing with the question is how is the mission of the association carried out through its organization and through its budget and finance policies and procedures. <clears throat> there are certain basic principles we want to be sure that everyone understands. Some of these are obvious. ALA is a very complex organization with a diversity of needs and a diversity of interests. ALA represents many different types of libraries. ALA represents many different types of library professionals carrying out different functions in our libraries around the United States and around the world. In spite of this diversity, we also try to be a very inclusive organization, setting up processes and communication channels so that we reflect the full spectrum of our membership's interests and needs as we structure the organization and as we carry out its budgetary process. We have a complexity of policies, systems, and processes to get the work of ALA done. But each of these supports, checks, and strengthens each other so that the collective works together very well. It's important to understand how ALA is constituted. Uh, we are a 501c3 organization. We are a not-for-profit organization. We work for the benefit of libraries and librarians across the United States and across the world. And therefore, because of that status, uh, there are certain things that we can do and there are certain things that we cannot do. So we are managing very carefully where we raise our income from. We're careful in terms of our relationship to the political process. It's important to understand that tax designation because it influences the way we organize ourselves and the way we carry out our budget and finance procedures. We also created a number of years ago another organization, the APA, which is a 501c6 organization. It has certain things it can do which are not enabled in ALA, which is why it was created. It represents an organization that can provide formal certification uh, for the educational work of our professional community. It's also an organization that can make some effort to improve the status of libraries, librarians, and professional library workers and support staff workers uh, working in libraries across the United States. These are limited to the work of APA and its 501c6 status. A lot of our work in terms of influencing the legislative and legal process is carried out by the ALA Washington office. Uh, lobbying intersects with our tax status in a very important way. Uh, we have the ability to educate uh, legislators and people who work in the political process, but there are limitations in terms of our participation in that process. It's also important to understand that our 501c3 status opens up certain potential liabilities 
for those of us who work and participate in the business of the association. The association does provide liability insurance, but in spite of that, we need to be cautious in terms of what we do, what we say, and where we say it. And it's good to understand those limitations and that tax status. Clearly, as a very large, complex organization, there are uh, routine legal transactions that define the work of ALA. Clearly, we work in accrediting library school programs. We license our products. We own the copyrights for our works. We have certain trademarks that we have to protect our marketing capacity. We sign contracts, and we live under and work under regulations at the federal and at the state level. This complexity of tax status and legal and lobbying capability are important to understand the organization and work of the association. The governance structure is also critical. Uh, this is a complex organization. Uh, it has a council, uh, a group of individuals who are elected from the membership across of the organization, and they sit in a policy role in relationship to the membership of the organization. An executive board is elected out of that council that has certain delegated responsibilities in terms of the finances of the organization and in terms of working with the executive director and his staff. Uh, there are a number of important committees that are established across the organization, uh, council committees uh, that carry out the work of the organization. We also have a complex of divisions and roundtables, uh, these various groups that have been organized to reflect the special interest and needs of the memberships. Uh, we also have uh, a committees that exist within the executive board to carry out uh, the policy and, and process responsibilities uh, of the organization. And we have chapters uh, throughout the United States, uh, basically at the state level, uh, that intersect uh, with our members on the local level and reflect the special interest and needs of librarians and other information professionals uh, working in, in those uh, state environments. Uh, so clearly, this is a very uh, complex organization of policy groups, regional groups, and standing and ad hoc committees that carry out the work of the association. This complexity is reflected in the budget and finance work of the organization. Looking at the way the membership organiz organizes itself, it's also important to understand the way the staff of ALA is organized. We work through a executive director. Uh, Keith Michael Fields. Um, he has working with him uh, Mary Geekus, who oversees all the member programs and services, and you can see those uh, listed on, under her name on this chart. Uh, we've been building over the last several years uh, a major development and fundraising capacity, and Kim Olson Clark is the director of that office. Uh, Cynthia Vivian uh, runs the human resources, the personnel function, and Joanne Kempf. Uh, is the, uh, the head uh, interim director of the governance office. So this is one side of the ALA organization from the staff perspective. But there's another suite of activities that takes place as well. Greg Calloway runs the finance and accounting section. Uh, we have a very important advocacy role and education role in Washington uh, for the legislative and legal issues we care about. So Emily Sheketoff runs the Washington office. Uh, we also have a strong relationship uh, with our members uh, directly through their membership in the association, uh, through their work on the local level, the state level with the chapters, a whole series of public programs, and increasingly uh, a, broad, a broad involvement around the world, and therefore the importance of that international relations office. And lastly, you can see the, the publishing office under Don Chatham. Uh, we have a, a very robust publishing program at ALA, and this is the office that makes sure that not only the traditional print-based program advances, but we increasingly are able to invest in electronic and digital publishing as well. So we've seen the complexity of the organization from the member structure, and we now see it from the view of the way the staff of ALA is organized as well. The budget structure, uh, in many ways, reflects this complexity. Uh, each year, we establish an operating fund for the organization. Uh, this is basically broken out into three groups. Uh, there's the general fund that supports the overall general work of the organization, uh, the publishing program, the conference program, the members program, and the work of the various offices that serve the entire organization. 
But each of the divisions and each of the roundtables also establishes an annual operating fund. We have major investment in buildings. We have the headquarters building in Chicago. Uh, we have the Washington office, which uh, carries out the ALA legislative initiatives. We have a new building in Connecticut, which supports the work of choice. And of course, all of our furniture and equipment. So each year, we also establish a capital budget that takes care of the maintenance and the purchasing of, of the equipment and support and technology that we need to do our work. Uh, several years ago, uh, the ALA board recognized the increasing importance of refreshing technology and the very systems and hardware and software that support our work. So we established a special technology reserve fund, which combined with the capital budget has given us the ability to really invest in a more strategic way in the technology of the organization. We've also seen an enormous growth over time in the grants and awards that we're receiving. Grants from various uh, corporate sponsors, uh, various foundations, and also our ability to bring in funds from federal funding agencies. Uh, these are uh, extremely important to advancing the work of the organization and gets us into some complex issues around managing grants and managing these external funds. Uh, some of them are uh, restricted in terms of how we can use them. Uh, very often some of these grants will bring with them a certain amount of overhead revenue that needs to be managed and invested in the general administrative support uh, that is provided for carrying out these grants. Uh, ALA also has uh, an advantageous financial position because we've been able to invest uh, our, some of our funds. Uh, some of these funds are restricted. Uh, when we receive funds from the outside and we invest them uh, in bonds and stocks, uh, sometimes we are restricted in what we can do. Other gifts that we receive uh, are unrestricted and can support the general work of the organization. Uh, we basically have structured uh, our long-term investments uh, into an endowment-like uh, organization. Uh, this is run by a group of endowment trustees that works with a, a financial advisor to make sure that the funds, which are banked, if you will, by ALA, are well managed and produce revenue that support the work of the organization. So we have the operating fund, the plant fund, an increasing amount of grants and awards coming from outside the organization, and the investment of our funds in these long-term or endowment-like structures. The decision-making process at ALA is also very complex. Uh, I've noted the important role that the executive board plays. Uh, it is uh, elected out of the council. It includes also the, uh, the four elected uh, members of ALA leadership, uh, the past president, the current president, the former president, and the treasurer. Uh, the uh, executive board works very, very closely with the council. Uh, the council involves individuals who are elected at large, as well as representative of the different sections, uh, groupings within ALA, uh, divisions, chapters, and roundtables. Uh, the uh, council does have a committee, the Budget Analysis and Review Committee, otherwise known as BARC, that advises council regularly on financial and budget issues. Uh, the uh, Finance and Audit Committee is another important piece. It is a committee of the executive board uh, chaired by the treasurer uh, and also deals uh, in partnership very often with BARC with the regular and strategic budget issues uh, that we often, often face. Uh, there's a strong commitment to communication in the work, in the budget work of the association. And several years ago, PBA, or the Planning and Budget Assembly, was created. Uh, bringing people from across the organizational structure to meet on a biannual basis at midwinter and annual to review budget issues and budget developments affecting the work of the organization. You also see reference on this chart the endowment trustees. Uh, we're actually increasing the number of endowment trustees because of the expanding uh, resources and the expanding complexity of working with our long-term investments. So this decision-making process has embedded in it a series of, of joint and shared responsibilities, as well as procedures and workflows that get the financial work of the organization carried out. As I mentioned, BARC is a committee of counsel. Uh, it is the organization that intersects with the Planning and Budget Assembly. Uh, we also work very closely with the division leadership. Uh, the divisions represent a very critical part of the programmatic and publishing and uh, advocacy and educational role of the association. 
Uh, the divisions manage their own budget within the overall ALA structure, as do the roundtables. And so council takes very seriously its need to get advice from BARC, but also to communicate regularly uh, with the membership uh, generally and with the divisions and roundtables. The executive board, as we mentioned, uh, works through a series of committees, including the executive committee, uh, the finance and audit committee that advises the executive board on key financial issues, and as we've already mentioned, the endowment trustees. Uh, we work uh, uh, very, very closely uh, with the senior management and with the executive directors of each of the divisions and the various departments uh, that exist around the ALA organization. Uh, the units which make up ALA are an integral part, clearly, of the budget and planning process. So this intersection of executive board, staff, and council is what enables us to manage well the finances of this very complex organization. Uh, it's important to understand some of the elements that fall under the work of these, in, of these various groups. Um, as we all know, uh, several of the divisions carry out uh, every other year national conferences. And this is a very important part of their overall financial planning and brings significant uh, revenue uh, into the work uh, of these divisions. The divisions are also largely responsible for the various programs and content that is shared at the annual conference and at the midwinter meetings. So the divisions represent uh, very much the professional development and educational arm of the association. And therefore, our finances uh, uh, at ALA and our finances in the divisions are very much uh, uh, targeted at making sure that we have quality programming at our, our national meetings. The roundtables uh, reflect the, the extraordinary diversity of special interests that exist across ALA. They also carry out important continuing education activities and also are very involved uh, together and with divisions in various joint projects and programs. Uh, each of these initiatives has the, its own budget cycle, its own budget parameters that govern how conferences, um, how uh, educational efforts, which are increasingly moving online, are managed financially through the organization. We also depend very much on ALA chapters at the local level. Uh, they help us promote library services and librarianships in the states, also in provinces and territories. Uh, and this really is a, a critical intersection between the work of the National Association and the work that takes place on the local level. Uh, the offices are very, very uh, important in understanding the work of ALA. Uh, unlike divisions, uh, which have income streams, uh, very often the offices uh, think of the work of the Office for Intellectual Freedom, the Office of Diversity, the Office of Accreditation, uh, the Office of International Relations. Uh, these are but examples of the extraordinary array of interests uh, that ALA members bring to the work of the association. As I've already mentioned, the Washington office, uh, which deals with education and advocacy around legislative and legal issues, has become a very critical part of the presence and influence of, of, of ALA. <clears throat> it's important to understand where we get our money from. Uh, there are certain core businesses which have defined ALA for a long period of time. Uh, membership, the annual dues that we pay to participate and work within the association. Uh, this has been an area of relative stability in terms of individual memberships, but we've seen some recent declines uh, in the organizational memberships uh, in ALA. And we're learning how, uh, why that's happening and trying to educate and advocate for the continuing participation by libraries and vendors uh, in their membership in the organization. We've had a robust publishing program for many years. Uh, we're very familiar with ALA TechSource and ALA Editions. Uh, these are very, very influential professional uh, communication channels. And uh, ALA Publishing has made a very important transition uh, to embrace not just traditional print-based publishing, but an expanded array of digital products as well, and pushing out a lot more web-based, webinar-type educational efforts linked to its various publishing activities. Midwinter and annual are important parts of the revenue stream of ALA. Uh, these are obviously very influenced by the location of the midwinter and annual meeting, uh, and these are, are holding up pretty well in terms of the overall health uh, of the ALA organization. We mentioned earlier the expanding role that grants and awards play 
Uh, and as we bring in grants and awards, we're also seeing overhead from some of the grants uh, play a critical role in supporting the work of the organization. I should also mention here that our investments, both our short-term investments, our cash investments, as well as our long-term endowment investments, are also producing important revenue for the organization. And as that expands, uh, we can begin to invest in some new areas and move the work of the organization forward. Uh, we've also done, over the last several years, some very careful thinking about how do we produce more and different products, and how do we take those out to both our existing and potentially new markets. And here are some uh, areas of activity and exploration that are going on at ALA in terms of new business opportunities. I've already mentioned our effort to move more aggressively into electronic publishing, uh, and that is proving to be very successful as libraries begin to reshape uh, and individuals begin to change their expectations about how they want to receive and use information. We're also beginning to see a much more integrated approach to ALA's effort to provide continuing education for its members, uh, and the online presence of ALA as an educational source for librarians and library staff and other information professionals will become increasingly, I think, an important part of our, our overall income stream. We're trying to take more and more of the products and services that we offer uh, out to an international community, uh, particularly looking at the potential in Europe, South Asia, and East Asia. Uh, we've documented about a million dollars plus in revenue coming into ALA from international sources through membership and attendance at conferences and purchasing of our publish, publishing products. But we think we have uh, an opportunity here uh, to do that uh, more, uh, more expansively over the next several years. We've also wondered whether there are some things that ALA does that could be more beneficial to public, to the library user community, and to extend our products, particularly our publishing products, out to individuals who use our libraries and care about libraries and support libraries. Uh, so a new publishing initiative at ALA called uh, Huron Street Press, I think, is, a, is an effort to produce the types of products that would not only be of interest to librarians and library staff, but potentially to the public at large. We're also looking at whether there are opportunities uh, to merge with other organizations, perhaps even to acquire other businesses that would be appropriate for LA and which would enhance our ability to serve our members better, better but also to produce potentially uh, expanded revenue streams for the organization. Uh, I think as Keith said at the beginning, uh, we're hoping that you will um, see this as a valuable orientation to the organizational structure and the budget and finance work of the organization. We really welcome your questions and hope that you'll submit them through ALA Connect. Uh, you'll find lots of other information and financial related uh, data on the Treasurer's web page if you look under financial learning. Uh, other things that are included are the operating agreement, the things that govern the working relationship between ALA and its various units, um, how we manage our long-term investment funds, and what the overall calendar and multi-year process is for our budget planning and budget process. I think this has been a, a very useful opportunity uh, for me to think about the organizational structure of ALA and to present to you some thoughts on how it intersects uh, with, our, with our budget and finance work at, at, at the association. So I'm going to turn it back to Keith. Thank you, Jim. This concludes our discussion on organizational structure. We'd like to close the session, as Jim suggested, by encouraging the viewers of this presentation to complete the survey located on the Treasurer's page. The submission of questions is strongly encouraged. We'd also encourage you to take the opportunity to replay this and other presentations in this series at your convenience and as often as you like. Again, thanks for your participation.